freedom of utterance. Thank you for the oil for this meeting. Thank you for the hearts that you've prepared. Speak, Lord, your servants here. Thank you, Pastor. We bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. Go ahead. Give Jesus praise this morning. Go ahead. Glorify his name. He deserves the praise. Amen. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord. Once again, can we appreciate my brother and my friend, Pastor Chintok and Pastor Sarah Chintok. Amen. Go ahead and bless God for them. Aren't you glad for the gift? Aren't you glad for what God is doing with and through them? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Sarah, for um, the earlier message. I call it slow poison, you know, just... You know, you're just taking it, and, you know, it's not poison to kill. Uh, but, you know, there are some things, they, you're just sitting, you know, you're just sipping, you know. By the time you know the places, thank you so much. Can we appreciate Pastor Sarah for that word? Thank you. What a blessing you are. Amen. I want to thank God for Pastor Chintok and for all that God is doing with and through him and what God, how God has brought us together and built this relationship over the years. And um, like he said, um, God somehow has orchestrated our seasons to have very similar things about, you know, the same times. And, and um, uh, I once, one day I said to him, I said, we don't meet often, but every time we meet and we start talking, it's as if we had, we had always been together, you know, amen. So that you know that your hearts are needed Praise God. Hallelujah. And thank you for the labor for this meeting. What a great labor. You know, what a great labor. Thank you for the wonderful uh, reception. And all for all, also, you know, hosting so many people from everywhere. The Lord continue to strengthen the work and your hands in Jesus' name. I want to acknowledge all the uh, ministers of the gospel from all over the nations. Amen. I may not remember the names of everyone. Um, my my good friend and my brother and his wife, you know, Reverend Ocholi and uh, his wife. Praise God. Hallelujah. I can make it bishop if that is too small. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Thank God for Apostle, the chairman of the board. 
Apostle Ayuba. Let's appreciate Apostle Ayuba. Amen. Thank God for Prophet Adam and his wife. Let's bless God for them. Amen. And um, my wonderful sister here, uh, 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 Pastor Mrs. and Pastor Moko. Is it Moko? Am, am I correct? Thank you, Pastor Oko. Sister um, Ako, sorry, not Oko. Ako, so I noticed that I pronounced it wrongly. Uh, my sister Abe, bless you. And everyone of us, I'm seeing Nenken, I'm seeing our brother from Wari, praise God. And everyone, and all the pastors of the God Life Assembly. God bless you. Let's appreciate God for them. Amen. I love Pastor TV. I fear Pastor A. You know, he's sitting up there like a principality somewhere. Amen. Praise God. Uh, and everyone of uh, Kano, you know, I, I, I was there at the beginning. So, you know, we have to talk. <laughs> Amen. We have to. Yes, you know, the husband man shall be the first partaker. Praise God. Hallelujah. Niger, I'm still waiting. You know, we have a conversation we have not finished. Praise God. And um, 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 Abba. Abba Kliki. Yes. You know that I pastor your mother-in-law. So you have to treat me nice. <laughs> you have to treat, treat me nice. Nicely. You have to be very careful with me. Uh-huh. And your, your, your brother-in-law worships with us. You don't, you don't know. I pastor your wife's family, so. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to be careful. You know, when you see me, act nicely. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And tonight I want to acknowledge the presence of my wife. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Uh, we knew ourselves together for five years before we got married. And we were married for how many? Fifteen years. Somewhere. So I've known her for twenty years. Just get a pastor. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming around. She she came she came from Abuja, I came from Gombe. She's going back to Abuja, going back to Gombe. <laughs> Praise God. But she said she has not been in camp meeting for a number of years and she needed to come around. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, um, I want to, sh- a lot of things are going through my heart this morning. TV, we had to bind TV when he was speaking because he was entering into territory that, uh, amen. So, um, once we begin to consider the matter of culture, there is a critical thing we have to understand. Once we begin to consider the matter of culture, we have to understand something very, very important at the heart of culture. And that the, the, in, the intention of culture is to stifle the capacity of your mind to appreciate or to receive the things which are of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because your... Can I have three protocols? Just three of you. Let me try and demonstrate something. Just three of you, as quickly as you can come. I want to demonstrate something. Just stand. Yeah, give space between yourselves. All right. So, of course, basic, basic Bible knowledge. Uh, man is a spirit, right? He has a soul and he lives in a body, right? Your body is designed to operate on the earth. Your, design is, your body is designed to interact with the earth. Uh, that is why when you have any defect, somebody is blind, somebody is lame, somebody whatever, it makes it more difficult for you to relate to the earth. Not to God. Hallelujah. It, the, every defect in you makes it more difficult for you to relate to the things that are on the earth. Amen. And um, your spirit is what directly deals with God. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Your, the God can deal with any part of your body, but the entity that has the responsibility to deal with God on a daily basis is your spirit. Are we, are we, are we good with that? So your spirit is more conscious about what is happening in the realm of the spirit. Hallelujah. Now, your mind is the interface between your body and your spirit. In other words, anything from your body that, need, that is trying to get to your spirit, if your mind blocks it, it cannot move. Anything that is coming from your spirit that needs that your body needs for let me give you an example. If you are watching a movie, example, which is actually an activity of the soul because it's an engagement of your mind, and suddenly you sense in your spirit that you need to pray, your mind has to cooperate with your spirit. If not, your body will not take action. Are we, are, are we together? So, when your spirit and your mind agree, your body submits to it. If your mind and your body agree against the intentions of your spirit, your spirit will have no choice about it. Every time your mind gangs up with any part of you against the other, the other becomes a victim of that, of that particular part. Are we together, church? So, when, yesterday we talked about conditioning. This conditioning usually would take place. So, when something is a culture, we said culture creates three things. Culture creates atmosphere. Culture creates conditioning. Culture creates system. Is that right? That's the, that's the intention of, of culture. To create an atmosphere, to condition you, and to make you systematic in what you do. Now... The part of you that actually every, including kingdom culture, David said, I was glad. When they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. This was how the Lord revealed it to me, man. David was busy doing some, he was king. So he was busy doing some kingdom assignment. Whatever it was, whether he was... He was passing a budget, whatever it was he was doing. He was not necessarily the... When I read that scripture, the vision God gave me was not necessarily that David was in prayer. It was David attending to life. And then somebody, possibly a friend, was on his way to the temple and said to David, Hey, Dave, I'm going to church. And David said, I was glad. In other words, I left what I was doing because something that was of more... Something that had a greater value that what I was doing has come along. Are we together, church? Now, listen. If what is happening is that David had a culture in him that was stronger than the mundane things of this life. So when that, when that, you know, when that vista was opened for him, that means that that culture, even, you know, you, know, you can have a culture of going to church. And I hope you know it's not a bad culture necessarily. Praise God. So David said, I was glad. When they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. The idea that I was going to go and meet with God became something that gave me joy. Praise God. That means that David had been conditioned to respond to the matter of going to the presence of God. So all through scripture, you hear David talking about it. He said, I wait upon you more than they that wait for the morning. You know, he said all night. You see David talking about his relationship with the presence of God. It is a conditioning. And that means that once it comes to what has to do with God, I have a very funny thing in my head. Everywhere I go, if I see a nice building, the first thing that comes to me is that should be a church. And any, anywhere I go, anywhere I'm traveling, I see a nice building, I say, that should be a church. Because I believe that God should have the best. Are we, on, are, are we together? Now, so if you're going to deal with a matter of culture, what happens here must be dealt with. Because there are things God can deposit in your spirit. So let's go to, thank you guys. So let's go to Romans, thank you guys. So let's go to Romans chapter 7. 
Romans chapter 7. Let's look at Romans chapter 7. Let's look at verse 18. Romans 7. Let me show you. Romans 7. We're going to do a long reading. Romans 7 from verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. At the end of Romans 7, you will discover the cure. Praise God. Paul said, in other words, let me put it this way. Based on the revelations of God in my spirit, I know what to do. There's a confirmation, there's a there's a, there's a thing I'm supposed to conform, I'm supposed to do. But I find myself not able to do it. Next verse. For the good that I will do not, I, I, that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law. That when I will do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. In other words, where does the law of God reside? In the inward man, in the spirit. Praise God. And I actually would, I actually love, I know that it is good for me. Praise God. Next verse. But I see another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind. Which means that my mind wants to do that. In my heart, I know it is right. I know it is good. I would love to do that thing. But there is also something. There is another culture. This thing that is worrying what I know is good is another culture. Is what I have been used to. Is my instinctive response to the situations of life. Worrying against the law of my mind. One day I was talking, I was talking when I was a younger Christian, I was talking with somebody, you know, who was an older brother in the faith. And we we're talking, and I, I you know, you know that that you know that those prayers we make, um, Lord, forgive me for the sins of omission and for the sins of commission. So as I was saying it, he stopped me in the middle of the prayer. He said, How many sins have you ever committed that was unconscious? No. Do you know that many times when we do what is wrong, we plan it? Are there any Christians in the house? We, we, we design, we actually design how, is, how we're going to execute it. Somebody gave you something, you are supposed to return to him. And you didn't return to him when you should have returned it to him. And then the person calls you. And says, I've been waiting for you. You've not brought it back. Instead of you to simply say, brother, I'm sorry. Uh, Forgive me. You say, oh. You know, there are some people who have a ministry. Have you met people who know how to give excuse before? It's a ministry. It's one of the the gifts of the spirit. (laughs) When they coin an excuse for you, even you, you would begin to say, no, keep it. Keep it first. Don't come with it. And it is something we, we it's somewhere in, our, in, in, our, in ourselves, praise God. There's something that tells us, let me, let me find a way to avoid this matter. So, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Yes. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then, with the mind. I myself serve the law of God with the flesh, the law. In other words, until you have dealt with your mind, until you have come to the place. That's what scripture will say to us, for we have the mind of Christ. Until you have come to the point where, you know the Bible says, let this, let, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Until the day that you begin to think the thoughts of Jesus, 
you begin to think what would he do in this situation what should be the proper response in this situation how ought i to walk in this situation according to scripture you will not be able to defeat the issue of culture so paul said this is what i'm going to do i must serve god with my mind i'm taking us somewhere chapter 8 I'm, I'm taking you somewhere. There is therefore now no condemnation. Let's go to verse 3. Just take me to verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh, for they that are after the flesh, do mind the things of the flesh. You know, I discovered something very interesting in scripture, sir. It saved me a whole lot. I discovered that God didn't call me to fight the flesh. God called me to walk by the Spirit. Now, I want you to understand that every culture finds, every ungodly culture finds its expression in the flesh. So, I, I discovered that I don't have a business trying to fight the flesh. My responsibility is to walk in the spirit. Scripture says walk in the spirit and if you do it, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Listen, when I'm speaking about the flesh in this context, please understand that I'm referring to every culture that is not the culture of the kingdom of God. So Paul said, for they that are after the flesh, how do they do? They do mind the things of the flesh. The, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So remember those three guys. Is that right? So every time this guy who is in the center is looking at the spirit and minding the things of the spirit, the things of the flesh have no power over him. Every time he turns and puts his focus on the things of the flesh, the things of the spirit, can, are we understanding what I'm saying? So, that is how you begin to transit. If you're going to transit from the cultures of this world into that which is of God, into being led by the Spirit, which is the culture of the kingdom, the thing that you must begin to do is begin to be mindful of what you are minding. So, yesterday, Pastor Tindok said something that blessed me. He said... Okay, if you, don't house, if you don't have house rent, what is it? You know, the things that trouble us, the things that take our heart off God, we have never really taken time to really assess it. We've never. So, for they that are after the flesh, do mind. That is where the issue is. And, and I'm trusting God that within the time I have, we were going to deal with some few things. Because I have a desire that when you walk out of this meeting, you must walk out a free man. L l please listen. You listen. You cannot, you cannot be in prison and experience freedom. So the first thing, if somebody is going to give you freedom, is that he must take you out of that prison. And listen, the prison is this. They that are after the flesh do mind. That is their focus. That is the things that they are worried about. That is what they are concerned about. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? See, listen. There is somebody. I'm, I'm, you know, when people are writing things in church, you know, one of the things I began to do that helped me, you don't know how this theme is blessing me. Because it, those were my challenges in working with God. That is where I come from. You know, sir, me, I'm not, you know, I told you yesterday that you will be in church and you see worship is going on and somebody is crying and you think that it is the Holy Ghost that is in operation. You don't know that is the girl, the boyfriend used to love that song and they broke up. So it was, it's not actually the spirit of God that is making the person cry. You are the one that thinks this will. So you will be in church. You will be talking. And you see people writing notes. Can I, can, I say, can I say something? Can I say something? Let me say something quickly. There are two things you should be writing when people are preaching. And since I'm speaking, the last thing you are writing is what the person is saying. Whenever a person is speaking, scripture says, 
The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. In reality, word of knowledge and word of wisdom is not supposed to be that somebody stood up and said, hey! One, one, I looked at someone, somebody said, I'm flying. He said, I'm flying. I'm over Ghana. Sincerely speaking, not because of her. He said, I'm over Ghana. He said, I can see a village. Is your village? You, see, even if it is correct, you don't need to do it. You don't need to fly. You, you, are you, are because they are only, because we are not given capacity to fly. If you are a man of God that is flying, we see, we hear. So if you are flying, we need to check. Because Pastor Doctor says some ministers are not born again, really. So we don't know what capacity there is. So listen. Somebody should be able to be speaking. So when you are writing, somebody should be speaking and the Holy Spirit through what that person is talking is talking to you. Now what the Spirit of God is telling you is what you should be writing. Some, some people, the, the, you are take, the way you take notes, you have not, you are under one university culture. You know, you are still there. When they were dictating and you are, you, are, you know, you are just, you have not stopped it. That culture has followed you into church. What you are supposed to be writing when a preacher is speaking is that you are supposed to be writing what the Holy Spirit is saying to you through that person. Because within what that person is saying is what the Spirit of God wants to tell you. So, some people are in church, you see them writing, very busy. So one day, one lady was writing and writing and the pastor was so happy. After service, pastor came down to thank the sister. So the sister dropped her note to greet pastor. As she dropped the note to greet pastor, she greeted pastor, so excited pastor greeted her. She was going. So pastor, she left her notes. So pastor went to pick the note and said, sister, come and collect the notes. You left your, your journal. When pastor looked at the journal, things to buy in the market, tomato, <laughs> rice, oil. They that are of the flesh, what do they do? So, pastor, pastor knows that this sister is struggling with offense. And maybe that day you were preaching about offense. And in between tomato and rice, when she had, of, she, she had what you said, she said, yes, sir. Preach on. Glory to God. And then when you came down, she said to you, pastor, I was really touched. And she was really touched. But, sir, there was no transformation. Because the critical information she had, she needed to have, her mind was not on what was being taught. Her mind was on the things of the flesh. Uh, is anybody getting what I'm saying? Now, this, that, is, that is why faith cometh by hearing, and hearing, and hear. Praise God. So, the place of the mind in dealing with every form of culture is critical. So, you need to understand this. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He doesn't say so he will be. So is he at that moment. So is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he, so he is. So listen. The old wine bottle, sir, is not old because of longevity of usage. It's old because of the strength of the fermentation that has taken place on the inside of it. So that is the reason why somebody can come up to church today and can experience a transformation today. And there can be somebody in church that has been in church for five years and has not experienced transformation because it's not a matter of the longevity of what, what is inside the bottle. It is the, the strength of what is inside the bottle. It's not how long it's stayed there. Amen. So, you see, when scripture speaks to us, scripture does not first speak to our actions. It first speaks to the potentials in us, what we carry. So Isaiah 55, let's look at Isaiah 55 verse 7. Isaiah 55 verse 7. I want to see something, Isaiah 55 verse 7. Now look at it. Let the wicked forsake his way. And let the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let me read it again. 
Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Next verse. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. I want to say I put it to you. Church, I present to you something. A wicked man is not necessarily a product of what he's doing. He's first and foremost the thoughts he's thinking. An unrighteous man is not first and foremost what he is doing. It is the thoughts that are going on in his mind. For from the abundance of the heart, it is what is in the heart that eventually becomes manifested. So, we were going to deal with cultures, we must first deal with the, with the quality, the purity, and the strength of our minds against the things that are happening around us. Because often our minds are like sponge. It's like a sponge. If you put it in every environment, it draws from what is in that environment. If you put sponge in water, it will draw from it. If you put it in a bottle, you know, of soda, it will draw from it. Anywhere you put it from, once it's liquid, it will draw from it. So one of the things, that's why scripture talks about us guarding our hearts. That's not what I'm going to. So when we talk about strongholds, another word, how many of you remember the definition of a stronghold? Please simplify English. I have a dictionary in church, you know, and simplify English. Don't kill yourself about it. It speaks about itself. So, stronghold is what? Anything that holds you very strongly. That's all. That's all. Now, another word for stronghold is mindset. Is mindset. Have you met people who have certain mindsets? Oh. I will tell you one. Mindsets. You know, there are people who have a suspicious mindset. Suspicious mindset. They suspect everything. In that suspicious mindset, ma, is the fact that these people have not come to receive the security that Jesus gives. You will think that it's just... It's just the way they are. So you, you, are, you have a neighbor. You do, you do life together. You do stuff, you know. Especially if you have lived. How many of you have lived in this housing project where they do federal um, low-cost housing and all of that? Especially if you are living in story buildings. You know, you have this one that you are facing each other. We used to have neighbors like that. And I came to discover that Anytime they are going for Christmas, it is when they land their village that we get to know that they have traveled. Because, amen? I'm online, I'll not say something. I asked somebody recently. I said, in church, your wife went into labor, gave birth. And the church is not so large that we should not know that your wife is in labor. He said, ah, how come we didn't know he, he was dragging? I said, what happened? He said, she said, what if she dies? What if something happened? How, how many of you have had friends who you knew about their wedding like three days to the wedding? They, 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 is your, your, your friend, your good friend, you knew about the fact that the fact that they had a breakthrough when you visited them. And when you look at it, it's just what you are seeing is the tip of the iceberg. The real thing is underground. You will not know. You will just discover that in their work with God, they've been marking time. Because there's a level of revelation they have not come into. There is something that has not been broken in their mind. So even though they claim to be brought, you see, you see, when we say we are brethren, to many people, that word brethren is just, is just, it doesn't go anywhere. Because if I am your brother, 
there are certain things I must know about you. If I'm your brother and you applied to go abroad, you should be able to tell me, man of God, I'm trusting God to go abroad. I've just put on my, my, my application for a visa. Can you stand with me in faith? But how many of your friends did you discover that they were leaving when they sent you a chat at the airport? As they were just, I'm just boarding. I'm just boarding. You say boarding to where? You say boarding to where? The person has already acquired a house abroad, has settled many things, and it's now that you are getting to know. Sir, do you know I discovered that I am not the give testimony all the time? But do you know I discovered that there are some people who don't give testimony in church? Because if they give, you will know that God has given them, God that does something in their life. So, sir, most of their testimonies is to you, sir. Uh, I just want to let you know the Lord blessed me. So, you are wondering, why don't you share this testimony to strengthen the faith of another person? They will never say it in church. It's only to the pastor. By text me, say, sir, I just want to let you know that God has... And then, they, we have a way we share testimonies this day in church. The Lord has been good to me. I want to bless God. Life used to be very difficult, but God has opened doors. Amen. That is not a testimony. That testimony is not tasty. There is nothing tasty about the testimony that you are sharing. Because we, a testimony is supposed to be what Jesus did in your life. So we want to know, so that we too can lean upon the, the faith that you, that, that, are you hearing what I'm saying? But some people come and share something. So you are, when, they are, when they finish, you are more confused than when they started. What, what, so what did you, what did he really what did he really say? And you may look at it and just assume that maybe the, no, there is something, there's a mindset behind it. There's a mindset behind it. And if God does not deal with that mindset, and is a, is anybody here what I'm saying? Is a stronghold. Is a stronghold. Do you know that many people who don't give is not because they don't want to give, but there's a stronghold. There's a stronghold. And we, if God gives us time, within the time we have, we are going to look at it. It's a stronghold of this world. You know that common sense tells you that how to become rich is to gather. Praise God. And you know, <laughs> they teach you that these are the four levels of wealth. First, you must be able to earn. If you earn... You must be able to save. When you save, you must be able to invest. When you invest, then you must be able to diversify. Let me ask you a question. Did you hear you must be able to give in the four levels of wealth? Oh. So there's a mindset. Every time sir, you are teaching prosperity, I ask two senior fathers, why, why, don't, why, don't, why is it that we don't talk about... I say, ah... The people already are struggling with, it, with the spirit of lack. You know the spirit of lack tells you that every time you touch what you have, you are losing. So when you begin to teach prosperity to a man who is struggling with the spirit of lack, you have only strengthened his desire. So listen, when you pick that spirit of insecurity, you pick that spirit of, 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 of secrecy. You pick this spirit, is that okay? Of, of, of lack. When you put them together, you see a person who is walking, loaded with mindsets. So you are wondering, why is this man not making progress in his work with God? There are diverse ideals and ideologies. That was what Teve was entering into. I had to bind him in the spirit. So, there are diverse ideas. You just, the person looks okay, on just fine. But you're wondering, something is wrong with this man's work with God. This man is not making progress in God. And I'm going to show you something. Second Corinthians 10, verse 14. I want to show you something. Let's begin from reading, reading it from the Easy English Bible. Look at it. It says, 
It is like we are fighting in a war, but we do not use human weapons. Instead, we use God's weapons. Those weapons are powerful enough to destroy the enemy's strongholds. So look at how we use the weapons. We use those weapons to destroy people's wrong ideas. People's wrong ideas. And you know, those wrong ideas are built around us by culture. You know, for a long time, this was part of my own. If I was to get into a place now, you see the way that Pastor uh, Apostle Yuba's face is. No, do not look normal. Don't, no. You see his face. Praise God. Cameraman, look at Pastor, uh, Pastor Yuba's face. Now, look at uh, a, a Prof's face. Prof has the tendency to smile. Apostle Ayuba has the gift of ap- apostolic gifts. <laughs> now, there was a mindset I had, Pastor Chintok. The moment I walk into this room, I will just say, ah, uh, Prof is, a, is friendly. This one he doesn't like people. I have made a decision on that. It is a wrong idea. It is, see, you don't know, it looks simple. But listen, it is your capacity to judge men by sight. And it, 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 only, it is only manifesting itself in that form for that moment. But you will discover that going down the, you have missed many things that God put on your way because you judged men by the way they looked. And there are many things you will not come into because you judge men by the way they look. Wrong ideas. Next, let's continue. People may speak proud ideas that stop other people from knowing God. Sorry, I'm on your stage. Part of my concern because if God permits us, sir, we are going to look at certain mentalities and we are going to look at colonial thinking and neocolonial thinking. But then, we may not enter into that, but let me say this. You know, I'm worried about church. I'm worried about church. Sometimes, the people, Pastor Trintok said, Jesus, without a parable, will not say anything to them. Do you know why Jesus was talking to them with parables? It was because what God really wanted to tell the people, they did not have the capacity for it. That was why Jesus said, it's it's expedient for you that I go. For if I do not come, the comfort said, there are many things I want to say to you, but you cannot receive them now. One of the assignments of the Holy Spirit in your life is to increase your capacity to receive the things that God wants to put in you. Now listen. Jesus, knowing that many things he would want to say concerning the kingdom of God, the culture of the kingdom of God, was alien to the people, now found he went down to the level of the people with parables. And he spoke to them parables they could relate to. He said, a sower went to sow. 80% of them were farmers. Then he gave them parables. Are you getting me? What, sir? Well, sometimes I come to church, I'm worried. The title of my message today is the progressive progression of divine dimensions in unusual realities. So, the topic of the message, you are still trying to, by the time the man has gone halfway of the message, you are still trying to understand the the topic. You are still at the topic. Please don't, I, 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 can, I, can I speak my head? Because I said this one, this one is, is, is personal. Miss Abby, I'm not the, talking to you. Everybody has his own style, grace and everything. Diverse operations, I understand that. Have you noticed that everybody who wants to sing now must speak in tongues? We were just beginning to worship. Then the person starts, yeah, hey, hey. So, um, uh, she gabo guy. So, And it's a mindset, oh. It's a mindset because you think that 
If you sing in the normal way, people, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about you. I'm not. Sincerely, I'm not. I'm not. I'm trying to tell you that. I have fo- I followed you. I've, I've sat on your ministry. So I know what I'm talking about. I know Pastor Tudor. If he doesn't know that you are correct, you, he will not have anything to do with you. He will be far away from you. So, but are you understand what I'm saying? I am telling you that there are diversity of gifts and there are people who God has actually called to minister in that form. But do you know that many people are into it because it's a trend? And you know that, I hope you know that trend is a Babylonian system. So you will not understand that it's Babylon you are operating, no. If you don't know that it's Babylon you are operating, you don't know it's Babylon that you're operating. We were talking last night with, 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 with Apostle Ayuba. I was ministering to the worship leaders in our city. You were there. So, I was telling them that I said to them, I said, many of you, have you had gospel ministers, worship? They are referring to the congregation as their fans. Is it my fans? I, I, I have invited somebody to church to minister. He was ministering. He said, I want to thank my fans. You know, sir, because of time, we may not have to go into scripture and look at it. I hope you know that one of the things that the Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego were supposed to be taught was the language of the Chaldeans. And I hope you know that one primary critical matter concerning culture is language. And can I go for that a little bit to tell you that there is a proper use of the language. There is even a religious use of the language. Let's leave that one. You can be using the language, but you are only operating religion. That is what is called neocolonialism in the kingdom of God. Are we together, church? Are we together, church? Where is my scripture? Just keep my scripture. So, sir, proud ideas. People may speak proud ideas that stop people from knowing God. How are they speaking proud ideas that stop you from knowing God? Most of it, sir, is in church. They are talking so many loud things that it becomes difficult for people that are searching for God to eventually know God. So when people begin to tell you, and let me when people begin to tell you this, get this. When people as talk made a mention of you, when people begin to tell you. If you pray between the hour of one and three. Sir, those things have chased me from YouTube. They've chased me. When you pray, let, sir, let me tell you something. One day, let me share this. Real. One day I just woke up in my mind. And I said, today is four hours of prayer. You know, you don't know when those things seep into your spirit. Four hours. So, you know, I am determining the engagement with God. So, I began to pray. Sincerely speaking, sir, when God settled the matter, I said, God, it's four hours I determined in my heart. You know, when you pray, you don't, you pray, you know, you remember what I said about, about fasting? You fast until you have sorted the, the matter. That's how, that's also in prayer. That's the same thing you do in prayer. <laughs> there are some people, when people come and tell you, recently I saw one, let me publicly say it. I saw one. He said, if you don't pray for 20 hours, you don't know what you're doing. So, this was my problem. Let me tell you my problem. Let me tell you my problem. My problem now is this. Okay, why do you pray in the first place? Part of the reason why you pray is so that God can talk to you, so that you can go and do what God talked to you. So, you have 24 hours in a day. And you use 20 hours to pray. And God answered you at the closing end of the 20 hours. And it was around 9, 10 p.m. he answered you. And you needed to go and see the man you needed to talk to about the thing. And office has closed because you prayed 20 hours. What time do you have left to do what God told you to do? If you don't pray 20 hours, you don't know what you're doing. And can I say something to you? 
There are many people, let me tell you something. You know the Lord means that to me, sir. God is not so concerned about the how much prayer you are doing like the obediences in your life. You see, the reason why many people the reason why we are investing so much time in prayer often is that we are covering our disobediences. See, I went to, listen. Listen. I went to preach somewhere. They said, they said, they said, there was a woman's this thing. And when I looked, then I said to them, when the Bible says, wives, submit to your husband, and you don't want to submit, you come and use God to force your husbands to corner your husband so that you will not do the submission you are supposed to submit. Prayer, that prayer you are making will never change the situation at home. Sir, so you said something today. God told me, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church that he gave himself for her. So I concluded, the day a man marries, he dies. How did Christ love the church? Let's not go into that. Let me finish what I'm doing. Sir, I discovered that you cannot effectively love your wives if, you, if your wife if you don't die. So what I, I asked, I did. It, I spoke at the wedding recently. Have you ever been to any place where the man was, was where a man or a woman was complaining about his wife because she prays too much? Have you? Has anybody ever reported to you? Come to true. I said, my wife loves to pray. I, I don't want the marriage. Do you know everything we complain about in marriage is about our selfish desires? Let's forget about that issue. Praise God. So, we have ideas in church that have stopped people from knowing God. And most of the time, it's funny, but most of the time, those are the people who, those are the people we exalt. The people who make God so complicated. The people who make God so difficult. We show those ideas are completely wrong. So the assignment of the gospel is to show that those ideas are wrong. We change the way that people think so that they want to obey Christ. Give me the passion translation. The passion, thank you. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy. Let's take one fantasy and demolish it. How many of you like the idea of honeymoon? Honeymoon. Sincerely, be a Christian about it. Hey! I hope there are protocols in this church because I will need assistance to leave this hall. So, as I was saying, sir, I have discovered how many, there, there's somebody who got married in church maybe four or five years now. He's still in debt. He, the, the, I'm telling you that the person is still in debt. And because of the level of financial challenge, the marriage too has come under a lot of challenges all through these years. The, at the point I had to call and say, sit down. How much do you get? How much do you get? Because somewhere, 
In fact, two poor people are trying to get married. And then somehow, people help them with money, give them gifts of money. Sir, what should they be thinking about? Is it not, let's find a way of delivering ourselves from this thing. They take that money and they go for honeymoon with it. So one day, we went to your meeting. I took a few people with me, took, up, took some married couples with me. We went to the meeting. I can't remember which, I think it's camp meeting, but Natal Basi ministered in that camp meeting. So I remember, the, I remember that. So we were leaving the meeting. And we, came, we, came to, we got to Saminaka, which is about four hours. Four hours? Four hours to Gombe from Saminaka, I think so. About four hours. So there was an elderly lady whose daughter, as of that time, was in secondary school, the first child. But as their pastor, I knew that there was some issues. And the issue was related to honeymoon. The man did not take her for honeymoon. So, the brother was somehow honeymoon discussion entered the, the, the conversation we were having. And the brother was driving, was the one that was raising the matter. And he was not the husband to the woman. The woman and her husband were sitting at the back. So, I pinched the man. You know, I was sitting in front with him. So, I pinched him. I said, keep quiet. <laughs> the man didn't, he kept talking about honeymoon. I pinched him again. I said, keep quiet. When the woman had the issue at the back, with pastor in the car, the fight started. Until we entered church, because that was service, we drove into church. I don't want to tell you anymore concerning the marriage as of today. We demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God. You know, I'm talking, I'm looking at my time. And break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. Now, there's a place where I want to stop. I want to stop in this. There's a place where I want to take us in this conversation. When Pastor Chinto begins to speak to us and tells us that where we are heading to is Christ. You have to understand that the real thing about culture is that the assignment of culture is that it must subvert the image of Christ in you and replace it with another philosophy. Then that philosophy is now raised, you know, when he says we bring down every imagination that lifts up itself above the image of Christ, that, that the assignment that we are into is that this is Christ. And the only way that they can make you look, they can make it look is that some arrogant things rise up above the image of Christ. When you go into spiritual warfare by dealing with culture, is that you beat the relevance of that thing. Until when it stands beside Christ, it has no capacity to compete with it. I'm not saying honeymoon is not good, but when honeymoon lifts up itself beyond the image of Christ, it must be cast down. It must be cast down. See, let me tell you. There are many things you are fighting about in your home that you don't need to fight about it. The Bible says, I, I discovered minimum, minimum wage in scripture. If you have raiment and food to eat, sufficient, there unto be sufficient. Sir, the Bible does not tell us the kind of food. All those ones that want to make money before they marry, don't worry yourself. If you have raiment and food to eat, marry. <laughs> I discovered minimum wages scripture. Sometimes, the more money you have, the more trouble you have. If you don't have money, your options are limited. Even your visitors are limited. <laughs> there is no white gown in the Bible. You are the one troubling yourself. There is no black suit in the Bible. This is colonialism that is disturbing some people. Uh -huh. 
ask somebody, ask him, are you under colonial rule? Ask the person, are you under... Praise God. Yes, yeah, so let's finish these scriptures. We capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. We insist that it, we insist. Tell somebody from this conference, we insist. Everything that, every disobedience, we insist on the fact that it must bow. We insist. Our finances, we must bow. We insist. We insist. We insist. We insist. Final one. Give me a message. It's not the final one, but let me take it as the final one. We insist. We move out of this conference with an insistence. She's here. We have never argued on money. Never. She's here. Uh, as basic human means, not even spiritual people. Is either the money is there? Or it's not there. She cannot. Can I go a little further? I think the wedding was 2009. Somewhere late 2008, I gave her the card and the passbook. So, you know when I was delivered from, it is more than, I don't know what goes there or what is used there. I don't know. I only see the budget at the end of, I want to do this, I want to do this. Oh, we will need more of this. That's all. I'm a free man. You know why your wife doesn't trust you? She doesn't know what you truly have. It's amazing how we can be one in our body, but cannot be one in our finances. Let me not say anything. No, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. Let's go to where were we? Is it message translation? Is it message translation? Message translation. Because I'm trying to discover that because scripture says is raiment more than your body? Or but you know, in this culture, money is more than our body. <laughs> so they say one man said, Your money, your life or your money. He said, Give give me give, take my life and give me my money. <laughs> Sir, at the root of that is the love of money. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies. So, when you see a man wakes up and say, he's attracted to a man. You know warped, warped philosophy, philosophies. Tearing down barriers created, erected against the truth of God. Fitting every loose thought and emotion. Kai. An impulse into the structure of life shaped, shaped by Christ. I'm going to leave all this to Pastor Chinto to come and sort out. So, let me tell you what happens. By the time those mindsets have become a stronghold, often, we go into those mindsets or we take those mindsets most of the time because somebody taught us a lie as a truth. That is where you have not so learned Christ comes. There is a way you must learn Christ. The way you were discipled is critical to how you operate God. So if you were taught inadequately or if you were taught wrongly, you will take a position and it's a wrong position. So now, most of the time, we brought in those strongholds. One, because we were taught wrongly. 
Or two, because it protected a particular lust in our heart. And somebody said it, and we accepted it. Are we getting my point? But this is the problem with strongholds. When the thing has become a stronghold in your life, you know a stronghold can protect you from something outside, but it will also stop you from going outside. So the strongholds now begin to limit the, the, the expressions of God in our lives. So, 15 minutes, let me, put, let me close it this way. There are three major strongholds that we deal with. The first one is the Egyptian mindset. It's a very primary mindset. And the Egyptian mindset is built on two things. It's built on bread. Turn these stones to become bread. So, sir, Maybe I will, let me just tell you the other ones. I will close on this because of my time. We have the Egyptian, we have the Babylonian. The Babylonian mindset is built on certain things. The Babylonian mindset is the reigning mindset of our day. It is built on secularism. It is built on freedom. I have the right. Antichrist will ride Babylonian mentality. To, are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. Glo global, glo is it globalism or whatever, is Babylonian mindset. When people say we live in a secular state, they don't know it's more dangerous than saying we live in a particular religious state. Because the moment you say secular, it means everybody has his right. Have you noticed that we, we all have our truth now? That's the way you see it. That's the way I see it. One, it is coming into scripture. You can even interpret scripture. That's the way you see it. That's the way I see it. So at the end of the day, you become a god to yourself. So you are not necessarily having to worship something. You are actually, the worship is to you now. I don't want to go into God that. And then we go into religion. I wish I had time to go into religion. Because primarily, religion is the act of trying to find God. But the problem I have is that God has already found you. I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. He is the one looking for you. You cannot look for him. But let's leave that. Let's come down to Egypt. In Egypt, sir, you will notice that every time scripture talks about Egypt, it was because the kingdom of God. Sorry, sir. The first issue why the two things that cultures fight against is the image of Christ and the kingdom. I don't have time to go into that. But the very reason why they, where it is spiritual warfare is because you know that culture forms on the inside and the kingdom of God is on the inside. What culture fights is that kingdom that you carry. That kingdom must not be expressed. And the, Now listen. Every time you read scripture and you hear Egypt, you will discover that Egypt always seemed to be a place that was attractive to saints. Because there are ten famines in scripture. Ten recorded famines in scripture. And the first four famines in scripture the saints ran to Egypt for bread. Because Egypt does not grow its plant by rain. That's another matter. Egypt does not need the rain of heaven. That was why when God was sending them to the promised land, he said, I'm taking you to a land where you will not water it with your feet as you did in Egypt. Because it drinks from the rain of heaven. That means that in the actual direction of God, your direction ought to come from him and not from Egypt. But you see, and that is kingdom. Kingdom, see, so the issue now is this. So every time there was famine, Egypt was an alternative. But every time the saints went to Egypt, they became slaves in Egypt. Every time they went to Egypt, they took what they had and they exchanged it with what Egypt gave them. So Abraham went to Egypt. And on his way back, he got, <laughs> he got a small girl like that. Isaac was on his way. Generational cause. So Isaac was on his way. The moment that God said to him, hey, don't try the mistake of your father. Now, can I say something to you? As good as yes, they, the, God had to take them to Egypt to form them as a nation. But my brother, they ended as slaves. So every time Egypt invites you, know this, you will not come out. You will come as a slave. 
That is the second intention of Egypt. That's why God said to Moses, they will not let you go except by a strong hand. So if you enter Egypt, the Egyptian mentality is the strongest culture that you must beat. It's, it's strong because even when God was speaking to them on the mountain, they knew that Moses had gone up to that mountain. They said, as for this man, we don't know what has happened to him. They said, bros, do something for us. And they did a calf, which is a god in Egypt. And they said, this is the god that brought you out of Egypt. So, you know, sir, 10 minutes, I'll say it on your stage. How many people jabbered? Because of bread. Why is Pastor TV? All those people that are moving, they are, I'm sorry to say, they are brethren. No. But check, bread may be in the equation. No. Bread may be in the equation. Sir, if you, if, if you just decide now to say, um, let me look for somewhere that is very far. Let's send the brother to go and start. We, just, we feel led to go and start a walk in, uh, let's say, Damboa. You know Damboa? So for those of us that don't know, Damboa is the headquarters of Yaran, Yaran Malang. Yaran Malang. It's the headquarters. That's local government where they're situated. If somebody was to tell you, let's go and I have an impression in my spirit that the Lord wants to start a walk in Damboa or anywhere around that place. Sir, do you know how many people you are going to find that will go there? But sir, just say, uh, there's an NGO that is going to be paying 1.5 million weekly. And they will take you by helicopter and bring you out. Sir, so you don't need to finish the sentence. So. And I can assure you, they will, they will know, they, nobody will tell you, let me pray about it. Uh, I, I saw a job, I have all the qualifications. In fact, a member of the church is on the board that is making decisions, but I would like to pray about it. A sister said to me, sir, why are you always saying that? Uh, why are you always saying that when you preach, you talk about us being careful with rich brothers? I said to her, because that is where the temptation is. It's very difficult for you to be tempted by a poor brother. So that is why we preach against rich brothers. When, when you see the temptation of a rich brother, you just fall into it. Somebody said the easiest way to overcome a temptation is just to fall into it. Is, sir, is bread. And when this thing started, the, I did a teaching. Did you notice that they call those places green pastures, but it's in the Bible. Lord lifted up his eyes and saw the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible put what is called an aside, for those of you that read literature, in brackets, before the Lord destroyed Sodom. The day that Lot was looking at Sodom, judgment has already been called upon Sodom. Lot did not know. One of the kingdom cultures you must imbibe is the culture of sharing your intentions with other brethren before it becomes a decision. Because if Lot was wise at all, Lot would have said, Uncle, Abraham, because who, who did he follow? Did he, did he get himself to where they got to by himself? Was it not that he was connected to something that he prospered? Was there anything Lot did that brought him personal prosperity? Would even common sense would have told him, this man has gone ahead. This man went to where there was no address. This one that is even an address. Shouldn't you ask him and say, Sir, give me your counsel. What do you think? You know, sir, 
people have taken offense with me on the issue of Japa. Listen. Every man that went to Egypt didn't come back with what he thought he would come back with. The intention of Egypt is to enslave you. It will enslave you in mind and body. And the attraction of Egypt is bread. And there is a lot of structures around our lives that is controlled by bread. Even in ministry, that many people are doing ministry for the sake of bread. Because at your meeting now, the worship meeting, somebody said that, uh, what if you, you that, uh, what if you, you, you prepared to go and minister and they rehearsal because I said, don't ask for honorarium. So they said that, um, I didn't say don't collect honorarium. I said, don't demand it. There's a difference between collecting something and demanding for it. I mean, we've had, I, see, you don't know. You don't know. There are some things maybe we, you don't know. Your pastor, your pastor, in the dark, some of the darkest days of my life, went to minister for me and slept in the same room. I think Pastor Emos was with them. Pastor Emos was on, was on that team, if I remember very well. Five of them, one mattress, in, in my associate's house. And when he came out in the morning, I had nothing to give him. All I had, my father just passed away, and my sister three days in between. So now when I tell you I've been to a crisis, I know what crisis means. Three days in between. All I had on me was 10,000 naira. I said, sir, put fuel in your car. He will not accept. So you don't understand the covenant. Blood was shed here. You don't understand. Blood was shed here. He said, ah, what if we did rehearsal and we spent like 20,000 in preparing to go for the rehearsal? I said to him, bros, it is your ministry. Is God that called you. Who is that good and faithful servant? Whom the master when he comes will find him. Your job is to give what has been given to you. And your, it is your job to prepare for what has been given to you. you. Nobody owes you anything. Nobody employed you. So when you see those cultures. Praise God. When you see those cultures, you think that it's just people just doing stuff. You don't know that it is coming from somewhere. And the intention of Egypt is that you will never come to a place where you will find yourself. Praise God. Did we receive that word? Can we bow down our heads in prayer? There's a prayer in your heart. I know there's a prayer in your heart. I know there's a prayer in your heart. We've come to a point where we are the ones that know our strongholds. Can you talk to the Holy Spirit tonight? What has he pointed out to you? What has he lifted? What is the red flag that he has shown to you? I want you to make that your prayer. We can't all pray the same things because we are not facing the same things. Pray your own prayer. Lift up your own. Where, where is your own struggle? Fill us, fill us, Lord, with you. Fill us, fill us, Lord, with you. Fill us, fill us, Lord, with you. Fill us, fill us, Lord, with you.